regardless of your calorie intake, um, the fats that you consume are still going to become a part of you. And they influence characteristics of your brain like membrane fluidity, which is a really important um, characteristic of your brain cell membranes. It allows them to be sensitive to the messages contained by neurotransmitters, for example. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now, it is true that the consumption of these fats hasn't shown in the clinical literature an acute inflammatory effect. So it's not like you consume these fats and, and you're then boom, see, getting, yeah. and then you're going to see inflammation, right? And as I mentioned, the, the amount of trans fats contained by these oils, it's a it's a small um, absolute percentage. It's about five percent um, trans fats. But at the quantity that your average American is now consuming these oils, it actually it all adds up at the end of the day. So while you not you might not see like in a clinical trial in the, in the, in the literature, um, an acute inflammatory effect, you're still fueling your body's inflammatory pathways. Hey, real quick, I'm going to give away the MAPS Power Bundle to one of you viewers right now. So the Power Bundle includes MAPS Strong, this is a strongman-inspired workout, and MAPS Power Lift, that's a powerlifting workout program. Both programs are about three months long. So if you do them back-to-back, -back, it's like half a year of exercise programming. So I'm going to give that away for free to one of you viewers. Here's what you got to do. Leave a comment the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel and turn on your notifications. If we like your comment, we'll notify you and you'll get free access. Now, everybody else, that power bundle is actually on sale, okay? So retails at 300 bucks. Right now, you can buy both programs with the power bundle for $79.99. So if you don't win it for free, you can still sign up. Head over to mapsmarch.com to learn more or just to sign up. Here comes the rest of the show. All right, Max, so canola oil. Is it really that bad for your heart, your brain, and your body? Well, canola oil is a grain and seed oil. It originates from the rapeseed. It was actually initially called the rapeseed rapeseed oil um, until they found a way to uh, minimize with genetic modification the the uh, a constituent of canola oil, um, urusic acid, which is actually toxic. And so now it's actually been called... Uh, it's been renamed canola oil, which stands for Canadian low acid, sort of a hybrid of the two. Oh, oh interesting. I had no idea. Yeah, yeah. And so now it's- I thought there was a canola plant. There's no I canola swear to God. plant. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's primarily um, sourced in Canada. And of the grain and seed oils, it's actually not as terrible, I would say, as uh, corn and soybean oil because it has a higher proportion of oleic acid or oh, monounsaturated fat. But it still has a, a relatively high proportion when compared to fruit oils like uh, olive oil and, avoc and avocado oil of linoleic acid, which is an omega-6 fatty acid. It's a polyunsaturated fat. Therefore, it's very prone to oxidation. And all grain and seed oils undergo intensive processing. And one of the steps that, that, that is part of that processing chain is called deodorization. It's basically the food industry's equivalent of the witness protection program where <laughs> they take these fats from foods that at first glance wouldn't appear to be um, fatty foods, right? Like an ear of corn is not something that anybody would describe as a fatty food. Wow. Soybeans are not fatty, right? But they use very intensive processing, sometimes using a neurotoxin called hexane, um, other times not, to extract this oil, which has, which, which typically um, comes with very bitter flavors um, and, and noxious, volatile organic compounds. And they put these oils through the ringer, and one of the steps is called deodorization, which makes these oils bland, gives them a very, endows them with a very high smoke point and allows manufacturers to use them in innumerable ultra processed foods, right? It's the same reason. It's why manufacturers use them to roast nuts in. They squeeze them into commercial cereals. They, you can use them in restaurants in salad dressings in spreads, right? The issue is that that step creates a small but significant amount of trans fats. And we know that there's no safe level of trans fat consumption. About 10 years ago, the FDA banned trans fats in their most common appearance, partially hydrogenated vegetable oils, but we can still find them in the food supply in the form of these grain and seed oils. And canola oil is an example of one of these types of fats that because of the preponderance of polyunsaturated fat ha contains man-made trans fats, which we know are poisonous to our cardiovascular system as well as our brain. Um, wow. That's okay. So, okay. So this is, I have so many questions now. Why are we using this such a heavy process to get 
these foods to be able to be consumed and used in products. The deodorization process sounds like we're trying to make it so it doesn't taste like anything. So we can throw it in foods and yeah. increase palatability or whatever. Why do we use them so much? Are they just super inexpensive yeah, because money, of right? subsidization? Subs- you know, they're subsidized? Or? Yeah. Very, very high margin products. Oh, These are typically... Um, most of the grain and seed oils that are on the market, it's it's because of the the profit margins, right? And and many are are were actually waste. But they were the byproducts of other um, food making processes. Um, for example, grapeseed oil is a byproduct of winemaking. They used to throw grape seeds away until one industrious wine manufacturer realized that you could squeeze these seeds, extract this oil, which again, very bitter, run the oil through a number of different industrial processes and wind up with this extremely cheap product, which is now worth hundreds of millions of dollars annually, the the sale of of grapeseed oil. And the same thing with canola oil. Now, these oils are, they're also heavily marketed and the woke nutritional orthodoxy loves them because they do lower LDL cholesterol, right? So that's actually why they continue to be promoted as quote unquote heart healthy fats. Wait, so so if you consume, if you replace other fats with these fats that we're talking about, you're, we will see a lowering of LDL. Yeah. Isn't that supposed to be a good thing? Uh, technically, yeah, it okay. is It is supposed to be a good thing. So when looking at cardiovascular risk factors, LDL and, and now in particular ApoB, um, which is a protein that, that, that wraps itself around um, the LDL lipoprotein um, and uh, and other lipoproteins in circulation mm. um, is thought to be an independent risk factor for cardio cardiovascular disease. But despite the fact that it lowers LDL at, when compared to saturated fats and certain saturated fats um, to be specific because a fat isn't a fat. Not all saturated fats are created equal. Some saturated fats like stearic acid are actually neutral from the standpoint of your um, LDL particles. Mm. Others can actually cause an elevation like myristic acid, palmitic acid. So in comparison to those fats, yes, polyunsaturated do- fat dominant oils like canola oil, grapeseed oil will lower your LDL cholesterol, but at a cost. These polyunsaturated saturated fats, as I mentioned, um, the oils that, can, that are rich in them have trans fats, which we know are not friendly to your cardiovascular system. They're not friendly to your brain. Higher consumption of trans fats is associated with higher risk for developing Alzheimer's disease and worse memory function, even in the young and healthy. They're also prone to uh, oxidation, which is sort of like a chemical disfigurement. Um, Studies have shown that commercially available grain and seed oils already have a significant degree. They've already undergone a significant um, degree of oxidation Mm. and a damaged fat damages you. These fats also integrate themselves into your body. You are what you eat, right? And this is especially true for the kinds of fats that we consume. We know that um, adipose tissue concentration, so our fat cells, the concentration of linoleic acid, which is the type of omega-6 fatty acid found primarily in these grain and seed oils in our fat tissue, has increased over twofold over the past 50 years alone. So we're carrying these highly damage-prone fats around with us in our adipose tissue. They get charted around our body by these LDL lipoproteins. They're prone to oxidation. They help convert our LDL lipoproteins to a more inflammatory phenotype. They're more likely to get taken up by immune cells, which can initiate atherosclerosis. So, you know, when you have an LDL particle that's chugging along, tugging along these these potentially pro-inflammatory fats, the immune system sees them as being toxic, right? Mm. So there was a study, I believe it was published in, in 1999, that found that compared to oleic acid, which is the primary fat contained in extra virgin olive oil and avocado oil, it basically makes your LDL lipoproteins toxic. So you're going to have lower LDL. But as, worse LDL. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, yeah. so you said earlier there's a twofold increase in these inflammatory fats in our own body fat. Yeah. So not only are we fatter, but the type of body fat that we're storing now it's is changing. Changing. Oh, interesting. I had no idea. Yeah. Making it much more inflammatory. And something just popped up for me as you're talking about this. Uh, something that might make this even more dangerous is that you may be blissfully, I don't know, either unaware or even kind of coddled a little bit by your uh, your your lipid numbers. So your doctor does a blood test. He goes, oh, your LDL went down. 
like, oh, well, my health is much better. Yeah. Not knowing that although the number went down, the type of LDL you have now because of these fats is more inflammatory and worse for you. So kind of gives you this like this double ed- this 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 issue where you you feel like you're doing better, you don't change anything, and you're going down the wrong path. Now, you- how how much does this conversation changes in the context of a calorie surplus versus a calorie deficit? Because I know right away that's the thing that there's there's the other side of the fitness space that will hear this and be like, oh, Max is an alarmist, and you know oils aren't that bad for you, and if you're in a calorie deficit, you're, t- yeah, you're fine. Solved. So you know, in, in the context of a of a calorie deficit and a surplus, how much does this conversation change? Well, I mean, the it doesn't change the fact that you are the fats that you eat. I mm. mean, fats are not like glucose, dietary sugars, for example. Dietary sugars actually, you burn them off, you store them in the in your muscle tissue in your livers um if you don't burn the glucose that you're consuming or the or whatever the source of dietary sugars that you're consuming right away they get siloed on they get siloed for later right but the fats you consume actually integrate themselves into as i mentioned your lipoproteins your adipose tissue and also Mm. your brain your brain requires polyunsaturated fats the omega-6 and omega-3 fatty acids are essential and so regardless of your calorie intake Um, the fats that you consume are still going to become a part of you and they influence characteristics of your brain, like membrane fluidity, which is a really important, um, characteristic of your brain cell membranes. It allows them to be sensitive to the messages contained by neurotransmitters, for example. Mm -hmm. Now it is true that the consumption of these fats hasn't shown in the clinical literature an acute inflammatory effect. So it's not like you consume these fats and, and then boom, see, getting, yeah. and then you're going to see inflammation, right? And as I mentioned, the, the amount of trans fats contained by these oils, it's a, it's a small um, absolute percentage. It's about 5% um, trans fats. But at the quantity that your average American is now consuming these oils, it actually, it all adds up at the end of the day. So while you're not, you might not see like in a clinical trial in the, in the, in the literature, um, an acute inflammatory effect, you're still fueling your body's inflammatory pathways. And the other thing is that the enzymes that we have in our bodies that convert, we know that people in <clears throat> the, that consume the standard American diet under consume omega-3 fats, mm-hmm. right? Like icosa pentaenoic acid or EPA or tocosa hexaenoic acid. Uh, hexaenoic acid or DHA. We know that people underconsume those fats. Omega-3 fats and omega-6 fats compete for the same yeah. enzymes in the body, right? They're called fatty acid desaturase enzymes. <clears throat> so when you consume plant-based forms of omega-3s like alpha-linoleic acid um, and linoleic acid, uh, the, they compete for the same enzymes which form, which convert them to the biologically active forms in the body. By over-consuming linoleic acid, you're basically disallowing your body to generate any usable EPA and DHA fat from the, from the plant-based omega-3s that you're consuming. You're the first person to actually confirm that. I brought it up on our show a long time ago, and, and you're probably way more red than I am on this. And I thought I read that somewhere that if we, even if we eat, like take an omega-3 pill, if you are over consuming the sixes and nines, they out compete the threes. So you don't even really get the benefits of the threes because the American diet is so high in the six and nines. And so, th- and this has to do with the plant based omega threes, or does this also have to do with the, like, let's say if I take omega threes from fish, cause those don't need to be converted like the plant ones. Correct. Okay. Those don't need to be converted. Right. With, um, the plant based form of omega threes, alpha linolenic acid, um, you require those, those, those enzymes. I mean, this is another argument for omnivory, right? Because when you consume preformed omega threes from fish, um, or grass fed beef, for example, they're already in their plug and play format. Got it. Um, but still lino alpha linolenic acid is still considered an essential fat. And we vary in our people vary individually in their, in their ability to convert them to the, uh, to the usable form. But that ability gets even more constrained when we overconsume these omega six fats. So that's just like adding fuel to the fire. It's like wow. one more one more issue. With now these fats. to to kind of uh, to talk a little bit about the overconsumption versus right the calories aspect. Now it is true that if you look at chronic disease like 
Alzheimer's, dementia, heart disease, diabetes, that obesity plays a large role. Uh, you know, uh, I think the data will show that a majority of people with any of those chronic I issues also is obese. However, here's something that a lot of people don't talk about or, or realize. There's a significant minority percentage of people who are not obese who have those issues. So you, you'll see like 15, 20% of people who die of heart attack are not obese. Right. Or 15 to 20% of people with d d dementia or Alzheimer's are not obese. So although the overconsumption of calories, I think, makes everything worse and eating less calories makes everything better, I don't think it solves everything. Um, and uh, I, I know with sugar, it makes a much bigger difference. With fats, it seems to make less of a difference. For example, if you eat low calories, but you have a lot of trans fats in your diets, probably better than than if you ate a lot of calories as trans fats, but yeah. pro but still not great. You're still going to see lots of these issues. Yeah. I mean, being in a, in a calorie deficit protects you in many ways. Um, it's a sort of hormetic stress to your body that, mm. that make that, that, that does make your body more resilient, but you're absolutely right today. About two thirds of adults in the United States are either overweight or obese, mm -hmm. but nine in 10 adults have some component of the metabolic syndrome. So they're so point. not obese people. They're not obese people. Yeah. yeah. About 20% of normal weight people are quote unquote metabolically obese. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So, so, and I, wow, and, and I want to bring that up because, um, and we talk about this on the show that, that calories are very important and we do talk about this so that people understand kind of the, you know, hierarchy. Yeah. The hierarchy of importance, I guess, um, only because as trainers and coaches, we found that when you present average people with like tons of information, they're like, oh, I don't know what to do. And yeah. so it's like, okay, do this first, see if this, you know, start with this and then we'll move to the next step and, and so on. But it is important to identify how some foods, regardless of caloric intake are damaging. So you could, and, and this is important because like I have a friend who lost his dad who uh, at like 50 something of heart attack, blood lipids look okay. He was, un, you know, normal body weight. Um, and so he was kind of like blissfully unaware that he had any potential issues, died of a heart attack, right? His dad, his grandfather died of the same thing. So it's kind of like silent in that case, because well, you don't, you don't appear to be unhealthy. Well, couldn't it, couldn't this be happening too? Like, let's say, um, you know, I, I mean, I'm an example of this, right? So, uh, I manage my, my body weight, even if my body fat percentage goes up a little bit, it always stays in a, in a, in a healthy range, but I definitely have times where maybe a few weeks in a row where I'm eating probably in a surplus, is it, um, you know, more detrimental, even for someone like me who considers himself quote unquote healthy, that during those times of a surplus, I'm eating oils like that versus yeah. if, you know, cause so, and I think that's where some of this research comes from, where you see these people that are like, oh yeah, they're, they're, they're not obese or way overweight, but I, I'm they're assuming healthy, right. I'm assuming that all it takes is to be in a surplus for that week and then also be consuming these oils that are not yeah. ideal for that. Could that be what, why that is, why those, why that percentage is still affecting those people? Yeah. I mean, I think it's like, I think it's the dose makes the poison. It's, it's another case. And there are many cases where the dose makes the poison. And that's certainly true for these. But it's also monounsaturated fat lowers LDL just as much as polyunsaturated fat. But there's no risk of the consumption of oxidized fats. Yeah. Because monounsaturated fats are just a little bit more saturated than, than polyunsaturated fats. And the other thing that's perplexing and honestly a bit hypocritical is that the Western medicine um, – literature seems to love the Mediterranean dietary pattern. We're mm. obsessed with the Mediterranean diet in, in within the, the medical and nutritional orthodoxy. And yet when you actually go to the Mediterranean it's regions of the world, yeah. nobody's using canola oil. Nobody's using no. grapeseed oil, corn oil, or soybean oil. They've um, oversimplified, haven't they? They say, oh, it's the monos, it's these types of fats. And it's like, they don't. I know it. My family's Mediterranean. We're yeah. from Sicily. There you go. They don't use those fats. The, the you know what else is really perplexing? Is that when you think about processed meats, right? Mortadella. Yeah, prosciutto. Yeah, these were these originate in the Mediterranean region of the world. Yes. And yet, and we love that we love to say how great the Mediterranean diet is, right? With regard to cardiovascular risk, with with regard to neurodegenerative uh, risk, right? How bad processed meats are, but <laughs> these processed meats originate in the Mediterranean region of the world. Yeah, and so how do we reconcile that? Yeah, I, you know why? Because uh, I'll tell you what: you go to a butcher in Sicily who makes. Uh, these processed meats traditionally, it is not made like the ones you find here at the grocery store. And what this tends to point to, and I'm going to, this is going to be a bit oversimplification. I think it's more complicated than this, but the further away we get from 
nature, okay, and I know some people are cringing right now, but you know, hear me out. The the more that is required to make something edible through modern science and processing, generally speaking, tends to make it not so healthy. Like like you said, you get a stalk of corn. Where's the fat? Where's the fat? I can't squeeze a stalk of corn and have oil come out of it. That doesn't it doesn't work. I'll get water that'll come out. Now I can go grab an olive. And I could squeeze it and oil comes out. I can grab an avocado and that thing is oily as hell. There's the fat right there. So it's, you know, all these fats that you're talking about, Max, it's like if modern science didn't exist, we wouldn't be consuming them. And they're so far away from the foods that we've evolved eating. It just like, where would you find rapeseed oil? You know, a, a thousand years ago, you wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to consume enough rapeseeds to get the amount of oil that we get. And then the other thing is that if if you look, and again, this points to the, the our consumption of processed foods, heavily processed foods, the ones that you find in boxes and wrappers and, you know, the foods that have long shelf lives, look at the fats that are used in those. They're almost all using these types of fats. And I think it has to do with the, the, the margins that you talked about. It would be expensive because one of the, the poles of processed food is how inexpensive they are. You, if you made processed foods with olive oil and avocado oil and you know natural oils, um, they would be much more expensive, and I don't think you would have nearly as big of a market. And I think that's probably is that where we get most of this consumption from processed foods. Yeah, yeah. And so it's true that when you become more cognizant of where these oils are and where they exist in your diet, and then you cut those foods out, you there is sort of a healthy user bias. You will start consuming less ultra processed foods because that is where they tend to mm -hmm. hide, right? Um, and so people will will see their health improve because they're just cutting out or they're they're at least minimizing their consumption of these ultra processed foods, which we know mm -hmm. are at the foundation of the obesity epidemic. But there's no good reason to consume grain and seed oils like canola oil, corn oil, and soybean oil, especially when compared to extra virgin olive oil, which is the staple oil in the Mediterranean dietary pattern, adherence to which is associated with robust risk reduction for cardiovascular disease. Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. And we see, I mean, in the hierarchy of evidence, there are so many different, there's so many studies and there are so many different types of studies showing us that extra virgin olive oil is the most valuable fat that we can consume. It's almost like medicine for the body and brain. It's loaded with healthy fats. It's, per, it's predominantly monounsaturated fat, which is very chemically stable. And then about 15% of extra virgin olive oil is saturated fat, which is the most chemically stable um, form of dietary mm -hmm. fat. It's got polyphenols in it like oleocanthal, which has been shown to be as anti-inflammatory as low-dose ibuprofen, right, which is a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug, but it doesn't possess any of the risk for side effects. Mm -hmm. We see there was a seminal study in the field of nutrition. Nutrition doesn't have a lot of large population, long-term randomized control yeah. trials, right? But the PREDIMED study was an example of one of these studies. It was a multi-center trial where they gave families a liter of extra virgin olive oil to consume uh, a week, right? So a liter of wow. extra virgin olive oil to consume every week. They found robust improvements in their cardiometabolic risk factors, their cognitive function, their waist size, um, a high fat Mediterranean diet with supplemental extra virgin olive oil. Yeah. Can I, can I just say something about this? So again, my family's from the Mediterranean. And I remember when I went there as a kid, uh, the percentage of people that smoked was insane. People smoke like crazy in these European countries, and yet they live longer than us. Just goes to show you how much of an impact eating this way has on your health because it counters. If you look at the percentage of people that smoke in Sicily versus or Greece versus, you know, in, in the US, you'll see it's a higher percentage, and yet they live longer than we do. And I'm not saying smoking is a good thing, I'm saying just how powerful these dietary interventions are that they can counter something as toxic for you as smoking to the extent where they live longer than we do. And they do use a ton of olive oil. You said a liter, and I you know, I know you kind of laughed a little bit. Yeah. I, I, I tell you what, man, you go to my mom's house or my grandma's house, and it's like a jug of water. Like the amount of olive oil that they, <laughs> olive oil is used for everything, everything. And if they use anything else, it's lard or butter, but it's almost always olive oil for everything. You can't, there isn't a single dish that we make, or you, if we add any type of fat, it's all that's it's always olive oil, and they they use almost none of those other processed oils. Now, besides the price, what else is it that the what drives the consumer in that direction? Isn't it also like the temperature that you can cook like canola oil and the types of foods that they're making? Because obviously, that you wouldn't fry in olive oil, you would you would fry in canola I think oil. Or olive oil might even be more stable than than some of those other oils, if I'm not mistaken. It is, yeah. I mean, oils vary in in terms of their smoke point, but smoke point and the temperature at which uh, point an oil becomes. Uh, potentially, potentially 
rancid and carcinogenic are unrelated. So oh. a, a smoke point of an oil um, is essentially determined by the solids that remain in the oil. For example, butter is very chemically stable because it's predominantly saturated fat. So it would have a high smoke point. Um, and it's got, there's a, it's a, got a very high temperature. It can withstand very high heat. However, it's got a low smoke point because butter has trace casein and lactose in it. Mm. Ghee, on the other hand, is, is clarified butter. So it's had those milk solids skimmed off. And therefore, the smoke point of ghee is actually quite high. But it's the, that, that temperature is more of a, like the smoke point is more of a culinary concern. It's, it, it can affect the taste, but it has nothing, it has little to no bearing on um, the health quality, the, the healthiness that. of that oil. Neither did I. Yeah, yeah, I thought it did. Interesting. So so what are the best, or I guess worst, uh, oils to cook at high temperatures with then, besides the smoke point, right? Yeah, well, you definitely don't want to use the grain and seed oils. Okay. Um, they do boast very high smoke points oh. because they've been so highly processed. So you can fry in them. They're not going to smoke. They're not going to change the flavor. Right. But you're creating some pretty unhealthy fats. Yeah. In fact, I think that the that the primary, um, the, 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 the primary place to really try to, uh, to, um, when you eat out in a restaurant, there's going to be some degree of grain and seed oil consumption. That's just inevitable. And sure. I wouldn't worry about that. Right. I partake in the modern world. I eat in restaurants. Yeah. There's no doubt that I'm consuming some quantity of these grain and seed oils, but I try my best to avoid fried foods because these oils are used in restaurant fryers and they're not changed between dishes, mm. the oils, right. They're changed sometimes like a handful of times on a weekly basis. So they just get worse and worse and worse. Worse and worse and worse and worse. So aside from the oxidation, oxidative byproducts are created like certain aldehydes, which are poisonous to your mitochondria, which are the ener energy generating mito um, organelles of your cells. They are potentially mutagenic. They become car carcinogenic um, to some degree. So I would absolutely avo avoid um, fried foods, but that's just a testament to, yeah, they're not smoking, but these oils are still generating invisible compounds that are not good for your health. Holy cow. I had no idea. Yeah. I thought the smoke point was the same thing. Yeah. So extra virgin olive oil, for example, it might have a lower smoke point, but it's very chemically stable. It's chemically stable because of the preponderance of monounsaturated fat, which is again, very chemically stable. And then about 15% of it is, is saturated fat. And on top of that, it's so rich in antioxidants, plant-based compounds that that literally protect the oil mm. that you could heat it to a very high temperature. It's just that it'll change the, it'll change the flavor profile of it. And it's got a, a lower smoke point than say avocado oil, which yeah. is just a bit more pure. And I do want to comment on the back to the margins and some of these oils, you know, we decided a long time ago as a country that corn was a staple crop and we subsidized the hell out of it. And just an example, we destroyed the sugar market in uh, Hawaii. So Hawaii grew sugarcane and provided much of the U.S. with sugar. And because we subsidized corn, so that means that our tax dollars go to making corn cheaper to keep the price down because, we again, we, we somehow established this is a, a staple crop, that high fructose corn syrup – uh, became much cheaper than sugar and it destroyed the sugar uh, market in Hawaii. And if you get, now if you get sodas or candies or whatever, if you read the back, the the sugar they use is high fructose corn syrup because corn is so cheap. Um, corn oil is cheap because of this subsidization, which makes the profit margins much higher, right? We make fuel out of corn which is weird. We take a food and turn it into gasoline. How could this possibly be profitable? Why would this even make sense? We're growing, we're using up space to grow food and then going through a process. Turning, it's all because it's subsidized. So a, a lot of our policies have actually uh, made our diets worse because we've made these foods artificially less expensive. And so food manufacturing, and us as consumers can't taste the difference. Um, although I, I, I'll i say I could taste the difference between sugar and fruct high fructose corn syrup and soda. Um, but a lot of people can't and don't really care. And so we get it, we, we consume them and that's part of the problem. So I think a lot of it has to do with that. Because uh, if we didn't subsidize corn, I wonder if we would go back to some of these other types of foods because then the margins wouldn't be so incredible. Yeah. The, I mean, the margins are are massive and, and high fructose corn syrup is just like in everything. High fructose corn syrup, it's not, it's not too dissimilar from just regular old table sugar. It's about 55% fructose, mm -hmm. uh, 45% glucose. I think there's a lot of fear surrounding high fructose corn sure. syrup. Like it's the devil. It really is. I mean, biochemically, it's not all that different from just sucrose, regular right. old, old table sugar. But the, the problem with, I think, sugar in the standard American diet 
added sugar in particular is that it's just everywhere. It has this insidious effect, yes. right? It's in our sauces. It's in commercial bread products. To make bread, all you need are four ingredients, water, flour, yeast, maybe some salt, right? But today you can look at any commercial bre bread product um, in the aisles of your, in the bread aisle of your local supermarket. They'll have added grain and seed oils. They'll have added high fructose corn syrup, various preservatives. So the food supply is just yeah. mutated and... Um, and I really think that like we've we've lost uh, a sense of awareness about what it is that we're we interested. have, and that's going to take me to this book that you wrote, uh, Genius Kitchen. And I and I want to first off, I appreciate everything you write. The stuff that you write is always phenomenal. I recommend it heavily to our audience. Um, I think you're one of the best people in the space uh, that talks uh, in a way that is easy to understand and apply for the average person with big uh, you know dividends. Like in other words, if you follow Max's advice you're going to see big dividends in improvements in your health. But here's why I'm excited about this particular book. Our markets are driven by consumers, okay? And the reason why we have added sugars and a lot of these fats and, and you know, and salts, and by the way, sugars, fats, and salts aren't necessarily bad, but you combine them in particular ways. And what they do is they make foods very pal palatable. And palatability, right, the enjoyment, how enjoyable food is to eat, is what drives... The market, if you look at any food category, especially processed food category, um, you'll find the number, the top 10 sellers are the ones that taste the best. And it's this combination of fat, sugar, salts, chemicals, colors, and there's a lot of stuff that goes into palatability, but these engineered combinations make food hyper palatable. And so it's, it's really hard to compete with when you're talking about, you know, eating natural whole foods, for example. So here's why I'm excited about this book. Because what you did is you put, and I looked through this and the, the, the recipes look phenomenal. And I've visited you many times down in, in your home in LA and you've, you know, we've eaten together and uh, Max is an incredible cook. What, you, what you're doing is you're fighting fire with fire. What you're doing with this book is you're, you're taking healthy ingredients and saying, look, here's some easy recipes and here's some food that is healthy but also is going to taste good. So we can outcompete those crappy foods because the, the, here's the losing strategy that we keep doing in the, in the health and fitness space is we say, eat healthy, eat healthy, eat healthy, but people, and this is just human behavior have to trade enjoyment for health. And I can make the case all day long and I have on my podcast over and over again. But at the end of the day, if I want to win the battle, um, I got to figure out a way to make food enjoyable that's healthy too. Yeah. And that's kind of what you did in this book. Was that one of the main motivations? Yeah. I wanted to make food delicious, hyper palatable because yeah, you, you do, you are competing. <laughs> You're playing, you've got to play on the, on the same playing field as these hyper palatable ultra processed foods that are just, that are just, um, so eye catching and, and difficult to avoid in the, in the modern food environment. Right. So you want to be able to play on the same playing field but unlike hyper palatable, ultra processed foods, you want the food that you're eating to be satiating. And when you're nourishing your body with quality ingredients, we know that it satiates your body in a, in a way that ultra processed um, packaged foods um, simply can't. In other words, you get full faster. Yeah. So you don't overeat as much. Yeah. The problem with ultra processed foods is that by the time you fill yourself up with them, you've already over consumed them. That's yeah. not the case with minimally processed foods. Now you, you're, you're processing food when you cook food, right? When you cook a steak, you're processing yeah. that yeah. meat to some degree. So it's not, it's not like we want to eat unprocessed food. Yeah, I'm not buying a cow at the grocery store. Yeah. But, <laughs> but we're talking about minimally processed foods, foods mm. that, that you know, you take single ingredient items from the perimeter of your of your supermarket. All supermarkets are designed in the same way. It's the perimeter of the supermarket where you find all of the perishable fresh foods. Um, and you take these single ingredient foods and then you cook them yourself. And whether it's the protein contained by the food, which we know is the most satiating macronutrient, much more so than carbs and fat, the fiber content of the foods, which mechanically, we know, stretches out the stomach, absorbs water, turns off the hunger hormone ghrelin, really important. Uh, or the water content. We know that food is a significant source of water. Shelf-stable packaged processed foods are not. They're dehydrated mm -hmm. because water degrades the shelf stability of a food, right? Mm -hmm. It attracts mold um, and the like. We know that minimally processed foods fill you up to the point, to the degree that when you've eaten them to the point of fullness, right? Ad libitum feeding experiments, which you talk about all the time, Sal, oh, yeah. show us that 
you actually eat to the, you can eat to the same degree of fullness, but you come in at a calorie deficit naturally. Yes. Right? It's an 800 calorie swing. That's huge. Determined purely by the quality Bro, of the food that you're like eating. That's like two and a half hours of exercise. People in 800 calories. hours. You'd yeah. have to get on a treadmill and kick your ass for two and a half hours to come out with an 800 calorie burn. Just give you an example. 100%. If you're trying to moderate the amount of food that you're eating, right? Like if, if you are completely ignorant to nutrition science and you go to, let's just say a really orthodox dietitian or um, even a medical doctor and you say, doc, how do I lose weight? And they say the oft repeated advice, eat less, move more. And gee, doc, thanks. Yeah. You <laughs> interpret that as, okay, I'm going to take what it is that I'm currently eating, right? The obesogenic food that I'm currently eating, which got me into this obese state to begin with. And I'm just going to try to eat less of it. You're setting yourself up for failure, right? You're putting your cart before the horse. You're trying to moderate how much you're eating. But the advice that, that I think needs to be given and is totally not given, especially in the context of the, of the woke fitness community, mm. right? The advice needs to be, look at the quality of the food that you're eating, right? Quality dictates quantity, especially today in the, in, the, in the standard American ad Powerful statement food environment, right? Yeah, so it's like, uh, imagine trying to eat less, but being hungry and then eating till you're satisfied, but you end up eating lower calorie. Like which one is a long-term, which strategy is, is gonna give you better success long-term? I, I wanna talk a little bit about uh, palate because I think this is where where people struggle is the transition into eating these these whole natural foods. Like if you take somebody who eats a standard American diet consistently, uh, everything right, fast food junk, they never eat like whole natural foods. And you you know take a dish. For example, last night Katrina and I made this gluten free pasta, like a lasagna that we've put together that uh -huh. we make. That's got grass fed beef and heritage pork in it, and then uh, we use a little bit of mozzarella cheese on there, and then this gluten free pasta. And I think it's amazing. But if you took that and you had somebody who eats lasagna every week that their their mom makes or whatever like that, and you have them the, the way the, eat that, they're going to go, oh my god, it doesn't taste anywhere <laughs> near that. But something that I have found that. I was so fascinated in this when I went through the process of competing where I was eating so consistent and eating so clean for so long is that I actually prefer that food now. Like I, I'll taste- Your cravings change. Yeah. They, yep. So I, I think that's the thing that I, I want to communicate to the audience because I, if you tell somebody like, oh, these, these recipes are, are, yeah. are better than this and, they, and they're used to eating such bad foods for such a consistent period of time in their life and they switch over that, they're like, oh no, that tastes nothing like my mom's barbecue chicken or whatever that's full of all this other bullshit. So is there, have you ever read like how long it takes somebody to change their palate like that or like how long that process is or how how clean does someone need to eat for a while before their their cravings start to change have you ever dug into that at all well i i think that there's a misconception that healthy food doesn't taste good and and i think that 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 is a misconception i think you can make totally healthy foods um taste incredibly palatable um and indulgent and i tried to actually in the in the new book genius kitchen i tried to um, create a number of comfort foods that um, that on first glance people wouldn't assume to be really really healthy and and nourishing to your body, um, but in fact are. For example, I've got a recipe for uh, gluten free super crispy buffalo chicken wings. I was going to ask you about that. Yeah, they look ridiculous, dude. Chicken. First of all, chicken wings are a wonderful so source of collagen. So any load bearing part of an animal, especially um, joints like chicken drumsticks, chicken wings four times the collagen as compared to breast meat. So collagen um, is actually a, a great source of the amino acids that um, your body will then use to create collagen. So mm. collagen proteins get broken down, right? Glycine, proline, hydroxyproline. Mm. The collagen that you eat doesn't necessarily become the collagen in your body, but still glycine is an important conditionally essential amino acid that um, researchers don't believe that we actually consume enough of. Mm. as part of the standard American diet. So dark meat chicken is actually a great source of collagen. Also, you get essential amino acids um, in, in chicken wings. And uh, and they're super tasty and indulgent. Like mine tastes just as good as the crappy fried ones. But typically when you get fried or, or any type of, you know, like standard buffalo wings in a restaurant, they're going to be fried in those oils, which we know are so un unhealthy, especially in the restaurant, yeah. in the context of the restaurant fryer, 
right? They're going to have um, this sauce, which God knows who know, what you know what kind of fats they're using in those in those sauces. Um, oftentimes, there's breading and, and all kinds of other junk on it. So there's a number of recipes like that in the book. Um, that that pro- I wanted to prove to people that eating quote unquote healthily doesn't have to be the end that's, of that's why that's what I really like about the book. So what you were saying, Adam, about um, palate changing. I have experienced that. And here's something weird, Max. Um, and I'd love your, your, your comment or opinion on this. I had clients that actually preferred the flavor of diet Coke to regular Coke or diet sodas or candies to regular sugar flavored candies. And I feel like the chemicals that they add to some of these products in to replace more natural ingredients like sugar, they hit our our brains and our receptors in ways that um, almost like have an addictive property where then sugar tastes less like tastes bland in comparison to let's say like aspartame or something like that. Are you, do you, do you know anything about this or have you ever experienced this yourself? Yeah. I, I mean, I typically avoid artificial sweeteners. Yeah. Um, I feel like whenever you mention artificial sweeteners, like Lane Norton, is yeah, like, yeah. going <laughs> to rise out of the like out of the shadows somewhere. And, uh, so you got to you got to watch what you say. No, I, I personally choose to avoid artificial sweeteners, mm-hmm. and I know that the research on them is in, in, with regard to their health effects is is equivocal. And right, um, but but I I personally opt. I like to I, I like to err on the side of caution. I take the precautionary yeah. principle, and and I use. Um, non-nutritive sweet sweeteners like stevia, monk fruit, erythritol, allulose, things yeah. like that. Yeah. Personally, yeah, I, I I don't like um, artificial sweeteners for two different reasons. One, because I feel like they have interesting addictive properties. This is my own experience, okay, with clients that they're that people tend to consume them and then consume more and more and more and more and more of them. And I think that a has to do with the way that they hit our. I guess are are the receptors that perceive the the sweetness, and then the psychological part. There's a psychological part too. There's no barrier mm-hmm. or no perceived barrier with artificial sweeteners because there's no calories. So whereas a you know somebody who's kind of health conscious might be like, eh, I'll have one soda, so I'll have 30 grams of sugar, but I'm gonna stop right there. Like, oh, there's no calories in this whatsoever. I'm just gonna consume a ton of this, and then that has been connected to at least um, in some of the studies I've seen to overconsumption of other calories. So like artificial sweeteners don't, unless everything's controlled. So they do studies, right? Where they control every calorie and then they replace sugar with artificial sweeteners. You see weight loss, but otherwise you don't see weight loss. Why Mm. is it that when people themselves cut out sugar and replace it with artificial sweeteners, which theoretically should lower the calories, why don't they lose weight? Because they eat more calories in other places, either because they perceive the, they, they don't perceive the same dangers. There's not the same barrier uh, in terms of weight gain or it's doing something funky to us that makes us want to eat more. So that's just my own personal observation. And I've never, I have yet to, the only people I've ever successfully worked with, with artificial sweeteners are competitors. And that's because they're so neurotic with their tracking that we can control everything. But I've never had an average person. Oh yeah. Let's, let's just have you replace your, your sugar with artificial sweeteners. It doesn't work. It's never really resulted in any, any progress or success. That's interesting. Yeah. I mean, I feel like for people who, who consider, the occasional diet Coke as their, as their vice, it, it, it can be, they can be used as a tool for adherence. Um, I think in, in as a best case scenario mm-hmm. use for them. Um, I don't drink, uh, artificially sweetened diet sodas. There is a, a, a brand of soda on the market. Oh, you've, you're drinking one, um, that's sweetened with stevia. Yeah. And, uh, and sometimes I drink those as a treat. My, I, my, my primary concern actually are the can linings. Mm. Um, exposure to compounds like BPA, yeah, because yeah, yeah. you don't know how those how the cans are stored prior to them making their way to your refrigerator, and so I'm I'm actually more concerned with uh, the presence, uh, the contamination of known endocrine disruptors. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. in those that was in your, your previous book. You yeah, kind of I about talked that a lot about those. Yeah, yeah. Now I feel like you also wrote this book because I saw some of the recipes. Uh, actually, I had Doug write some down, so I did write down your buffalo wings one because that one looked incredible. Uh, uh, the olive oil lamb chops with olives and artichoke hearts. Uh, looked amazing. Uh, so that's one I want to try. The no cheese cheesy egg dish. Okay, explain that to me. Yeah. It looks incredible. It looks Dude, really good. It's so bomb and it's <laughs> so easy to make. So the entire book, it's about 
99% dairy free. So it's a, it's a quote unquote cheesy, um, broccoli dish. The broccoli we make with a little bit of nutritional yeast, some coconut cream, um, sauteed broccoli in avocado oil. And you saute that up. Um, you throw it in one of these little, uh, oven safe dishes, preheat the oven to about 375 degrees, and then you crack a raw egg on top and then you bake it for 10 minutes. And you get this amazingly savory, super satiating, delicious egg dish, which takes about 20 minutes, I would say, all in to make. It's one of my favorite recipes in the book. It's super easy to make, quick. Did you um, did you make all these recipes or did you work with somebody? And I, I, I know you cook a lot. I yeah, watch your yeah. stories on Instagram and you're always making something. So is this all you or did you work with someone too? Yeah, I made I made the vast majority of them. And then just to just to fill up the rest of the number, I worked very closely with a recipe developer and I mm. gave them my sort of dietary um, philosophy and using the ingredients that I like to prioritize in my food, the, the the foods that I consider to be quote unquote genius foods, they sort of filled in the gaps and and, and picked up the rest. But now, they're they're all super palatable, super tasty recipes that if you have kids, the kids love them. Um, it's a mix of starter dishes, of main courses. We even have some sweets, some desserts. We use extra virgin olive oil in really unique ways, which I'm, I'm very excited about. We have an extra virgin olive oil sugar free ice cream. What? Yeah, <laughs> which is awesome. You've never had extra virgin olive oil ice cream? I mean, just picture no. sort of like a vanilla-esque ice cream, but with with a hint of extra virgin olive oil. It's super tasty, and it provides a, a new way to and get there's in There's no here. milk in that? There's no dairy, no. Oh, what? Okay. Yeah. You got yeah. my attention. Except whole, I can't have dairy, so. The, the whole book is, is it's 99% dairy-free, and the, and the dairy that we do use is ghee, which is very well tolerated, yeah. even for people who have dairy sensitivity. Yeah. Now, did you write this book for guys? Because I'm going to because here's the deal. Like I know dudes were terrible about cooking for ourselves. We tend to want everything to be as simple as hell. Anybody who's ever been to a bachelor's place and eaten with them knows that it's like, I mean, like, like for me, I, you know, I was, I got married real young, but I remember, you know, there was a period where I was alone and it was like, what are you having for dinner? I was like, you know, two cans of tuna fish and, you know, <laughs> and a bowl of strawberries, you know, it was like super basic or whatever. But the, 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 the recipes in here seem to be very simple. It's not like 50 million ingredients. It's not an, you know, two hours to make a dish. Was that one of the considerations? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the, the dishes range in terms of their complexity, but I would say that most of them are very easy to create. And I definitely wanted to ensure that the recipes require ingredients that are not difficult to find. They're low cost, highly accessible. Because the point is, I want my, I mean, all of the nutritional recommendations that I've made over the years, um, the whole point was for uh, one of the major, um, for me, my, my, my mission is to make the recommendations achievable. So there's no dogma um, in the book. That's why I have this sort of paradigm in the book where I talk about foods to um, avoid, but the list of, of foods to avoid is actually really small. And then I break down what to include in your diet into good, better, and best. Because mm. I find that in the wellness world, we often let perfect be the enemy of the good. Oh, good right? point. So when I talk about high quality foods, I'm not talking about like making sure that your beef is pristine and grass finished all the time, right? That's not to me like the the what the soul type of food because that would be super inaccessible for a significant portion of the of the population who reads my work, right? right. Like you, if you live in the middle of the country, for example, sometimes or even in a in a food desert, you might not be able to access the most pristine beef. But still, I want people to know that even grain finished beef, like factory farm beef, and I and I hate promoting food from the factory farm system is still a highly nutrient dense food and a much better option to eat for dinner than for example, boxed mac and cheese. So, mm. um, all the recipes feature very, uh, accessible ingredients, um, minimal steps. I really tried to minimize the amount of steps. And so, yeah, whether you're a, a, a novice in the kitchen or a seasoned pro, um, you're going to learn how to cook in the book. It's going to be, it's going to be really great. Now I want to talk to you about the organ meat dishes that you have in there. So organ meats, I talk about their value on the show. Probably the most nutrient dense foods you'll find on the planet are organ meats. Um, I mean, you can't like, like liver, for example, like you can't find a single food that's more concentrated in essential nutrients, uh, than liver, for example. But I always hear this from people. It's gross. I, I know you said organ meats are great, but I don't want to eat liver. I don't want to eat heart. I don't want to eat kidneys. It tastes like crap. So what about the recipes on that? And are they like, be honest with me, are they good? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Or are you just, yeah. <laughs> they're pretty good. Um, I will say that there's only, uh, there's a small handful of recipes in the book. So don't worry if you're 
organ meat averse. I think I only have two or three recipes in the book that include uh, organ meats, but one of the recipes I got from my friend Mary Shenuda. It's a it's a, a recipe called Bangin Liver, and it is the recipe single that single handedly converted me to a liver lover. It <clears throat> involves chicken liver, which is actually I find to be much more delicious than beef liver. Yeah, it's more palatable for it's, sure. It's way more palatable. And the spices and <coughs> the um, the fats that are used in the recipe, it's actually one of the few recipes in the book that that includes ghee. I think ghee is a great fat, very complimentary in terms of the flavor, flavor profile to cook liver in, whether it's beef or chicken liver. But this recipe in particular is a 10 out of 10 recipe. So even, even if you're the most liver averse person, I highly recommend people check check out this recipe. It's so freaking good. And it's, and it's one of the most nutrient dense recipes in the book. Yeah. Here's how I sell, uh, uh, liver. So I, I read this a long time ago as a kid, there was a, a bodybuilder, Vince Garanda, who he was back in the day, he was considered like the scientists of bodybuilding. I mean, this is back in the fifties and sixties. And he would always recommend that his clients or trainees, uh, eat a lot of eggs and a lot of organ meats um, and they would get these phenomenal results. Um, and he would attribute it to the cholesterol that was in these foods, dietary cholesterol. I started then reading studies as a kid about dietary cholesterol. And I found a couple that said that, yes, increasing dietary cholesterol makes you stronger. As an adult, I found more studies that show that dietary cholesterol makes you, builds muscle and makes you stronger. So I experimented with this one myself. I've talked about this many times on the show where I'll go through a like six to eight week period where I'm eating a tremendous amount of dietary cholesterol. And by the way, for most people, dietary cholesterol doesn't impact your lipids in a, in a negative way. There are definitely uh, a subset of people where this may happen, but for the vast majority of us, there's really no, no negative effects or whatever. But you get this huge strength boost. It's very, very interesting. It's very strange, but I build more muscle. And one of the best sources of dietary cholesterol that I found besides egg yolks is chicken liver. So you eat like two or three chicken livers and you get this boost of cholesterol, dietary cholesterol and dietary cholesterol. It's, uh, it, it's like, I feel like my CNS fire stronger. Uh, my, I recover much faster in my workouts. So that's how I like to sell it. And I do this and the guys know I'll go through, like I said, like a, like a six to eight week period where I'll, I'll you know, I'm eating 12 egg yolks a day and throwing in, you know, two or three chicken livers and my lifts will go up, you know, 10, 15%, which for me is huge. I've been working out for a long time. So Really interesting. I don't know, have you ever tried that before? Yeah, dietary cholesterol is interesting in the sense that over the long term, it's been shown to have no bearing on your on on serum levels of cholesterol. How it how it relates to my own gym performance, I haven't really I haven't really looked at that. But I generally eat a high diet. I consume a a, a high di dietary cholesterol. My my diet is pretty high in cholesterol mm -hmm. in, in exogenous cholesterol. But there was a great video put out by my friend Gabrielle Lyon, who's a do. Um, and it was a, an Instagram live video that she did with Donald Lehman, who's a nutrition PhD expert, expert um, nutrition researcher, uh, really prominent in the field. And they were talking about how in the short term, the abstention uh, or, or an increase in dietary cholesterol consumption will affect blood levels of it. Mm -hmm. But in the long term, it evens out. Because your liver, your liver your regulates liver, it. Your liver regulates it, right? But there's a lag time. Like there's a, it doesn't, it doesn't regulate it instantaneously. I think right? that's where I see the strength gain is in that lag time. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, because cholesterol is a building block of uh, all steroid horm uh, all steroids. It is a steroid molecule, right? So testosterone. It's also what you'll notice after working out is a drop in blood cholesterol because your body uses it for repair and recovery, yeah. and it's good for cell cellular integrity and you know, viscosity. And so, um, that's exactly, that's why I go six to eight weeks, six to eight weeks. I see this huge boost in strength and muscle gain. So it's a nice little hack. So if anybody's if you're like, you're going to compete in something, you're going to go to the beach, you know, or some event in eight weeks, like give it a shot. If you're healthy, like radically increase your cholesterol intake, force manage your calories and everything else. And then watch what happens. I've, so I've had people write me in who've tried this. I'm like, bro, this is the craziest thing ever. I didn't think wow. this was. Well, worse. for someone listening, what is that? What does that look like as far as numbers for you? First of all, I think you should probably track first to kind of see where your yeah. what, what normal is for you. And then, do you double? Do you triple? Like, what does that look? Oh, like? I'll go. So I'll go as high as ten to twelve egg yolks, for example. So you're looking at you know two thousand you know milligrams or something like that of cholesterol. Um, is you bumping? So you're normally at like a thousand milligrams. No, not even. I'm, I'm, I'll be lower than that, right? I'll okay. Be much lower, a couple hundred. And so it's like 10 times as much. 
um, and I'll just see this huge. It's really strange. The first time I did it, I think I came in here, yeah, and I was raving about it to wow. to, to the guys, and then I found more studies showing that it, it it improves strength in older adults and all this other stuff. So, little cool hack. Try it yourself. It's a lot of fun. I would love for you to try because I know you work out pretty regularly. So I'd love yeah. to hear your your results. Yeah, and I love my egg yolks. I mean, I actually I call egg yolks a cognitive multivitamin. So oh, it's, yeah. it's, it's not just that they're rich in cholesterol, they're rich in a number of other micronutrients that may support uh, uh, an anabolic, uh, a synergistic uh, anabolism effect, right? Yeah. But also really good for the brain. Well, the choline, right? And now I, there's a debate as to whether or not choline should be considered essential. Yeah. Is that is that true? Choline is considered uh, currently it's considered a conditionally essential um, <clears throat> nutrient. It used to be considered essential. It's actually a, 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 a type of B vitamin. Mm. Um, but we know that about ninety percent of adults in the U.S. don't consume the adequate intake for choline, and it provides a really important precursor uh, backbone molecule for our brain cell membranes. And it also choline provides the the precursor to acetylcholine, which is a really important neurotransmitter involved in learning and memory. So choline is crucially important and the top source in the, in the diet are egg yolks. Egg yolks are an yeah. amazing source of choline. It's actually, I mean, the fact that we've demonized for so many years. One of the healthiest foods of all time. One of the healthiest foods of all time. I, I, I love to remind people that when an embryo is developing, the first structure to assemble is the nervous system, which, which includes the brain. Yes. So an egg yolk literally contain, contains everything that nature has determined to be important to grow and sustain a healthy brain. It's no wonder that egg yolks are high in cholesterol because the brain is really high in cholesterol. That's true. Now, you don't need to consume any cholesterol for good brain health because the brain produces all the cholesterol that it needs. It's called de novo cholesterol mm. synthesis. However, an egg yolk contains a little bit of everything required, basically, to, to, to grow a healthy brain. It's a wonderful source of um, DHA fat, especially eggs that come from chickens that have had their diets supplemented with um, flax seeds. So mm -hmm. it's like omega-3 rich uh, egg yolks, um, carotenoids, vitamin E, um, choline, as you mentioned, yeah. vitamin B12. Yeah, there, in, in lots of cultures, um, you know, old cultures. And I like to look at what people have done for, for hundreds of years, because although scientific study, we consider the, you know, like the double blind placebo controlled study to be the gold standard of, you know, what are the effects of particular nutrients and foods on the body? And I agree that those are very valuable, but I don't think that we should discredit, uh, you know, hundreds or thousands of years of culture because over long, long periods of time, humans do a pretty damn good job of identifying you know, what works and what doesn't work. So if you look at like Chinese medicine, Ayurvedic medicine, you look at herbs that have been used, for example, ashwagandha today has got lots of studies that support it, right? But ashwagandha has been used for hundreds of years for all the stuff that we now have studies to support. And, and so through time, you see lots of benefit. And egg yolks are a staple food for children, staple and staple food for pregnant women. Um, and now we have the studies to show this. I mean, when my wife was pregnant with my son, we were, I, I was making sure she was having, egg yolks and eggs all the time. And I feed my, my son egg yolks all the time because I, I know, I know what the studies show, but I also know that this is a food that has been valued by cultures, by almost every culture for a long, long time for children. Yeah. I mean, the, the problem with nu nutrition science, studying nutrition is much harder to do than studying drugs. And yet it's much less well-funded. So that's why there are still so many question marks with regard to nutrition. And it's both a good thing and a bad thing. But I think at the end of the day, that is, that's precisely why we have to, we have to, we have to make choices through the lens. It's, it's, it's important to have our choices be informed by an evolutionary perspective, a common sense perspective. The longer a food or ingredient has been in the, in the human food supply, I think the more, um, the more, uh, weight we should give it in terms yes. of its inclusion um, in the diet. So people that are like, oh, you should cut out animal products or, oh, we should start consuming this, this new, you know, sweetener that's on the market. Um, artificial sweeteners, for example, I yeah. think, I think we have to uh, just consider the fact that, um, that we've, we've co-evolved with our food, right? Like we've co-evolved with food. And so I think that we have to look at dietary recommendations, especially when those recommendations are mired in corporate interest um, and 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 corporate profit with with much greater scrutiny. Yeah, a hundred percent. I know. And, it's, and what's funny is that we learn all the time new stuff about human metabolism, 
uh, about food and new compounds and foods that have new benefits or potential detriments. So when people pretend to know, and they'll say like, like in our space, this is quite common, this new meal replacement powder, uh, you never have to eat food again. So you can stay at your desk and work all day long and drink this powder. And it's perfect. We put everything in there. That's perfect that your body needs. It's like, we don't a hundred percent know yet everything that we need and how everything works. So it's super arrogant of us to even assume, um, you know, those types of things. So I think nature gives us a lot of those, uh, a lot of those answers. Yeah. I think sure. it's, imp- I think it's important to be evidence based, but not evidence bound. Mm. And I think we, you see too many people in the, in the nutrition space, especially the quote unquote evidence based nutrition space, um, being, not just evidence based, but evidence bound. And I think it's, uh, it's, it's hubris really. It's, it's, um, I think that that's, that's where a lot of mistakes get made. Yeah, right? totally. Now, Max, you, uh, you eat a consistent, really good diet. Are there anything that, that any things that you are supplementing? Like, do you, do you find that when you look at your, your diet that you have to take any other supplements or do you try and target all of your main nutrients from whole foods or how often do you have to go outside of that? That's a good question. I, I definitely supplement with um with magnesium glycinate. I mm-hmm. I actually found out recently uh, that I get migraines o- occasionally, um, and I know that my diet. There ha- are studies that actually show that eating a diet that is lower in omega six fatty a- uh, omega six fatty acids, higher in omega three fatty acids, <clears throat> are actually um actually uh, help lower migraine um, frequency and symptomology. Um, in general, but magnesium along with riboflavin are both very helpful in terms of. So you've been supplementing. I've been supplementing with those. Yeah, does I, it help? I, I've a, I occasionally get these weird headaches. I've I've gotten them about once to twice a month, probably for I mean for as long as I can remember. But uh, I thought that that was just like a normal thing. To does happen. it make a did it make a difference? I think it helps. I think it helps a lot. Yeah, yeah. I mean there there is robust evidence with uh, with regard to um, magnesium and riboflavin. Um, yeah, we, so we work with a company that Ned, you know, Ned, I yeah, think, just they make, um, uh, mellow and it's got some forms of magnesium. There's one form of magnesium in there that was actually, uh, developed, uh, and it's shown to cross the blood brain barrier. And I have never taken a form of magnesium that I feel hmm. like it's that. It's been life changing for me. It's, I had Adam, no big I, time. I had no idea. I take it every single night now. That's awesome. I started taking it and, uh, I fall asleep so easy and sleep so hard now. And so obviously I was deficient, right? I mean, if that, if it affected me that much, cause I doubt everybody gets that same effect as I have where it's like, oh man, I can't, I won't, I won't even travel without it. So how impactful it, it was. And I didn't believe it when I first took it. I was like, oh, maybe just something lined up that day that I slept so well. And I've tested it multiple times or, oh, let me not take it for a while. Let me see what I feel like. And yeah, it's, it's, been, it's magnesium three and eight, there which, you go. which has been shown to yes. easily cross the blood brain barrier. 50% of people don't consume adequate magnesium and there is no um, reliable blood test to see whether or not you are replete in terms of your magnesium yeah. status because magnesium magnesium doesn't really circulate in the blood. It's stored intracellularly um, and in your bones. So it's I think it's very smart to supplement with uh, with magnesium. Now, is that because we've uh, depleted the soil uh, through our modern agriculture? Is that one of the reasons why? Well, that's that is indeed part of it, but it's also magnesium is found predominantly. Um, you don't get a lot of magnesium in ultra processed foods. And today, 60% of the calories that Americans mm. are eating come from ultra processed foods. Mm. Magnesium is found in, in dark leafy greens, right? Magnesium is the molecule at the center of the chlorophyll molecule. Oh. It's actually quite interesting. Chlorophyll and hemoglobin are almost identical. Oh, I know. That's weird. I've read yeah, that. Yeah. With the ex- you, can, you can go to Google images and look for the two molecules, but the, the, the primary difference is that in plants at the center, you see magnesium and in us, you see iron. So anything uh, green, right? Because chlorophyll is green um, in the produce section of your supermarket is going to be a decent magnesium source. Almonds are also a wonderful mm. source in just a handful of almonds. You get about 25% of your daily requirements for um, your daily requirement for magnesium. Dark chocolate is another um, great source. But again, half the population doesn't con- consume adequate magnesium. And magnesium is involved in hundreds of different processes in the body that range in terms of their importance from the creation of ATP, which is energy. Yeah to DNA repair. So it's actually a, a really powerful anti-aging molecule right in front of our eyes, pretty much like in, in, in the, in the produce section of the supermarket. And most of us under consume that. And we spend lots and lots of money on other anti-aging quack products. Yeah. You know? Botox. Yeah. Botox, for, et cetera. <laughs> for example. Yeah, yeah. So magnesium, yeah. magnesium is, is, is super important. And, um, 
Do you supplement with creatine? Now I know you're you're look, you are a bit of a of a supplement nerd like I am. And I know this because yes. I've been to your house. <laughs> And you have sh- you have stuff all over the place. Now I know you don't take things everything consistently, right. but you like to experiment, like I do. I yeah. have a lot of fun with certain things. Do you take creatine on a regular basis? Is that a supplement you like to take or no? Um, I like to uh, I like to cycle it. Right now I'm not taking it, but I do I do like creatine. I'm I'm very impressed by the it's 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 perform it's efficacy record it's safety record um the health effects of it are pretty remarkable have you been seeing some of the stuff that's coming out with, with like with regard to the brain the brain yeah. uh arthritis um the heart it's pretty crazy yeah and uh and i do like that it, it increases like work output in the gym yeah um i i've been you know what it is i've been so busy lately that i haven't really been on my like a, a, an optimized workout regimen so mm-hmm. i feel like I feel like now is not the right time for me, for me to be on it. Cause I know you have to take it every day. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so I, uh, I haven't been taking it lately, but I do, it is one of those that like, I kind of cycle in and out of, mm-hmm. um, in general, I'm a, I'm a big fan of creatine monohydrate. Like I, yeah. I, I do take it. That's awesome. Um, I take fish oil pretty regularly. I take, uh, astaxanthin, which is a, a carotenoid that I'm a big fan of. I've yeah. been a big fan of for about 15 years. What's why it's really good for your skin for your eyes and for your brain. Mm. It's a carotenoid that's found exclusively in marine products. It's generated by algae. So algae that sit at the at the surface of the water, algae are exposed to the rays of the sun relentlessly, right? So it's a it's a huge source of oxidative stress. So to combat that, algae generate this incredibly potent antioxidant called astaxanthin. And then salmon among other animals, end up eating the algae and they accumulate this red pigment. So it's it's literally what makes salmon flesh. It's what gives salmon flesh that that characteristic Pink. deep, oh, deep red color. Yeah, with farmed salmon, it's it's actually put in the in the feed. So they supplement it. They give it supplementally to to farm salmon. But wild salmon naturally accumulate this red pigment. Um, it's one <laughs> of the reasons why we know fish consumption is is really beneficial to brain health, but. Studies have shown that astaxanthin isn't just good for our brains, it's great for our eyes, and it actually provides a, a photoprotective effect to our skin. So it's actually really good for um, for squ- skin oh, quality, appearance, and everything like that. It's just, it's a, an incredibly potent antioxidant. Oh, interesting. Um, Bruce Ames, who's a, a noted longevity researcher, he's about 90 years old, he's been in the, in the, in the field for a very, very long time. He published a, pa- a paper a couple of years ago where he... He actually um, singled out astaxanthin as a putative longevity agent. So, uh, so I'm a bit, I'm a big fan. Interesting. Of, of that I'll combat. throw that on the mix. Yeah, throw I, into the mix. I walk around with a supplement bag, so at least you in front of me. Oh yeah, dude, have a good time. <laughs> That's, That's awesome. Good. So, yeah. did did you? Was it you and your brothers that did a lot of the taste testing of this? Because I know you guys hang out a lot and you guys like to cook. And, and we do. Who are the people that were? Who did you test test all these recipes on? Yeah, I don't have a girlfriend, so uh, I mean, I, my 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 brothers. <laughs> it's my it's my brothers who get to be the guinea pigs. Um, but uh, but yeah, we, I love cooking with with the family. You know, above and beyond this conversation about uh, nutritionism, you know, and, yeah. and, the, and the nutrients that that foods contain. Food, it's such a it's such an important. We've we've talked about this many yeah. times, Sal. Like it, it's such an important way to celebrate life, right? Like the joy mm-hmm. of eating. It's a, it's a, it's the way that sharing a meal is how we bond, how we communicate, totally. how, we, how we express love. Totally, I love cooking for my brothers, and also. Eating at home is such a powerful leverage point for better health. Again, like beyond m- this conversation about about macronutrients and the like, right? You can eat the same meal at home that you get in a restaurant. It's in all likelihood going to have fewer calories, fewer fat calories, less sodium. Um, studies show that people who eat home more as opposed to out have uh, have a healthier BMI, so lower risk of obesity, healthier body fat percentage, better cardiometabolic um, risk factors, right? So eating at home, it's just, it's it's so crucially important. As psychologically too, it's very, it, there's tremendous benefits because the time that you spend making it, even if it's 15 minutes, you value the food differently. Yeah. Um, I waste less. I value the food more. Cooking with my kids is such an <clears throat> incredible bonding experience. Cooking with my wife it's one of my favorite dates. Like if we're going to hang out together, just her and I, if we cook together, um, it's one of my favorite ways to hang out with her or, also, or with friends. It also promotes just movement in general. One of the things that I know that it, I'm guilty of using DoorDash all the time, especially during the pandemic, you know, just have something brought to my house. 
And one of the habits that I catch myself doing is I come home from a long day at work, I get home, I, I door dash something, and it real easy for me for to be sedentary the whole rest of the day. Yeah. Doing something like cooking or cleaning in the house, like just that light movement like that promotes me moving throughout the rest of the night. And that stuff all adds up. And if you get in the habit of always having your food delivered to you all the time, which more and more Americans are doing now, I think that that stuff starts to add up and you just yep. don't, you don't realize yep. it. And one more thing too, if you look up, um, if you read studies on what is one of the most attractive things that someone can do for you, male or female, prepare a meal. Hmm. So if you're a guy watching this and you have a date and you want to impress your date and ask women this, they'll tell you this, cook her a good meal and you've already scored like 10 points. And of course, we all know that a, what, you know, what's that saying? The way to a man's heart is through his stomach. That we've known that for a long time, right? When when a woman cooks for you and you know, and she takes the time and effort to do that, it's like so, so incredible. So I mean, I, I love that you brought up all the other values of food and 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 cooking and doing that together. We totally have missed that. Aside from the mechanistic actions of the calories and the fats and all that stuff, we can't dismiss the the psychological, spiritual, you know, other stuff that we connect to food. You can't dismiss that because in my personal opinion, it's as important as what's in the food is uh, how you prepare it and what we do with it and how we celebrate it with it and the culture around it. Um, I mean, obviously look around, uh, you know, every culture has their own food and we have our foods that we eat in the breakfast, you know, for breakfast, lunch, and dinner and foods we eat in movies. And it's not just that dinners. either. We also, yeah. and we didn't touch on this really, but I think it's so important when you are trying to make better choices and you start eating healthier foods is not just measuring that based off of the, you know, how palatable it is, but also how you feel from it. Like that's yeah. part of what makes me choose the, the, you know, healthy version of lasagna that Katrina makes for me versus what my mom used to make as a kid is because I've now connected how each of them make me feel mm -hmm. afterwards. And you desire it more. That's what I'm saying. Like, yes. it's not that my mom's lasagna is still not amazing. It still is like going down, mm -hmm. but it all, but I'll also be in the bathroom like an hour <laughs> later, or I won't sleep as well, or I'll feel bloated afterwards. And so, and I think we, we've learned to ignore a lot of those signals. And so when you, if you're somebody listening and you're, you're trying to make that transition away from the, the standard American diet, and you want to start trying to eat more whole foods, you want to start trying to cook in the kitchen. Like, don't just measure, like, you know, compare, like, oh, was that as good as my chicken that I normally make? Also try and connect the dots to how the, those foods each make you feel. It you, makes it much dude, easier. You, you, you're so right. And this is a very important point to make because what gets us to crave foods isn't just the flavor of the food. It's also, and food companies know this, mm. watch a food commercial. It's, it'll connect it to something. Watch a beer commercial. There's right. chicks in the background and you're having a good time. And think of like a Corona. What do you think of the beach? Oh yeah, I have a bee and there's, there's you know, girls in bikinis. <laughs> it's a party time, right? Or Bud Light or whatever. This is very important to how, psychologically the kinds of foods that you crave and you want. And I've seen this with clients where I'll take a client and I'll have them introduce, uh, you know, let's say I have someone eat more vegetables. Let's say they eat no vegetables. I'll have them introduce vegetables. I'll have them pay attention to how they feel before, during, and after they eat the vegetables. And as they become aware, like you said, Adam, with they're connecting the dots to not just the taste, but also how it's making them feel, they start to slowly want to eat the vegetables without realizing, oh, I crave a bowl of bright. I've had clients tell me this, man. I, I was on a business trip for a week. First thing I ate when I got home was a big bowl of vegetables because it makes me feel so good. I actually wanted it. So it's not well just, yeah, yeah. yeah well cooked. <laughs> that's right. So it's not just, yeah. you know, the, it, it, all of this is part of it. So I'm glad you brought that up because yeah. that, if you, if you're trying to get yourself to, cause here's the, the struggle. The struggle is people know what they need to do, but they, it's so hard and they don't want to No, there's an answer. If you do this the right way, you will find yourself move more and more towards wanting to do the stuff that you know is good for you. And how easy is it to stay in shape and be lean and be fit and be healthy when you want to do those things versus pushing yourself and, you know, white knuckling it the whole time, right? That's the, yeah. that's the long-term successful approach. I yeah. Think, so. Yeah. In the book, I, I provide ways to, I mean, that's why I, I, the first half of the book is actually a kitchen and wellness guide. And, and one section I dedicate to optimizing digestion because I think digesting your food well is an important part of the conversation that, that we, if, if we're not digesting our food well, 
it's going to obviously make the eating process unpleasant, right? Like if we walk away from a meal feeling bloated and gassy, yeah. that's not how our food should make us feel, right? But you're also, you're not getting the most bang for your buck with regard to your food. So you could be spending all the money in the world on high quality foods. But if you're not, if you're not extracting the nutrition yep. from that food, then you're basically just throwing money away, right? Um, but also food and, and even hyper palatable foods, like the kinds of recipes that I, that I provide in genius kitchen can have a functional effect. I mean, I, I actually talk about the fact because you're right, like food during food at date night is such a powerful, I mean, it can be an aphrodisiac, right? Mm -hmm. And certain foods like foods that are high in dietary nitrates can actually support sexual function, right? Well, nitrates, well, they, they, you get uh, better uh, vasodilation. There so, you go. Yeah, and what does that make you, give you? Better boners. Better boners. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but also important for women, right? Blood yes. flow, increasing yes. blood flow. Like we have analogous- Women get boners too. Do you, write that, do you write that title down, Doug, for this episode? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, it's 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 important. It's actually really cool how, how it works. So foods that are high in nitrates, like beets and arugula, mm -hmm. humans don't have the enzymes to- um, reduce nitrates to nitrites, which is nitrites are actually what enter the nitric oxide pathway, mm -hmm. but it's the bacteria in our mouths that are, that are, um, involved in that process, uh -huh. break, reduce what's called reducing dietary nitrate to nitrites. Um, and so you really want to make sure that you're chewing your food slowly to give your oral bacteria time to do that. Digestion begins in the mouth. And that's absolutely true with regard to, um, nitric oxide boosting foods like arugula and beets. So those are the, those are the two primary, those are the, the most concentrated, concentrated sources. But, um, this is also uh, really important. You want to avoid to the best of your ability, frequent use of antiseptic mouthwash, because with mouthwash, you're nuking the bacteria mm. that are responsible for that conversion. Interesting. Right? So if you're a frequent user of mouthwash, you're basically shortchanging the ability of your food to have a nitric oxide boosting oh, effect. Wow. I did not know that. Yeah, and studies <laughs> just disrupts show. your new strategy. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you'll have minty fresh breath, right? But you're not going to be getting the the sexual performance boosting effect mm. of your nitrate rich yeah. um, dishes. And actually, studies show that frequent users of antiseptic mouthwash have a 50% increased risk of developing type 2 diabetes. Interesting. Yeah, because um, nitric oxide is also really important for insulin signaling. Yeah. It's super important. That's true. And they also found that frequent users, two or more times a day, right? So this is like yeah. two or more times a day is, is that is that sort of like threshold effect where this this um, impairment seems to, seems to emerge uh, twice the risk for developing hypertension. And also antiseptic mouthwash post-workout negates the antihypertensive effects of exercise. So if you want a healthier healthier blood pressure and to be able to extract wow. uh, a, a more cardio protective effect from your fruits and vegetables, ditch the antiseptic. I was mouthwash. using so I was using antiseptic mouthwashes because I read studies on how it it can help prevent uh, cardi um, uh, respiratory diseases like COVID. So I'm like, oh cool, I'm gonna gargle with you know Listerine to prevent the buildup of, of virus. But now I just learned this. this guys walking around gargling Thanks. all day. Yeah, you just screwed me up. <laughs> no, you want to get rid of it. Yeah. My water pick it. is okay though, right? That's good. Yeah. What'd my, you say? My water pick. That's oh, cool. absolutely. Oh, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. And mouthwashes that are not antiseptic. That really is the key. And also, I mean, if you use it, certainly if you use it uh, medically, that's fine. If sure. you use it, uh, uh, you know, on occasion, that's totally fine. I mean, your oral microbiome will repopulate itself. It's really the frequent use. Yeah. Um, I mean, still 40, 40 million people, I believe in the United States do use it every day. Wow, I had uh, no idea. Yeah, you know, I, Sal was like gargling it three times a day. He was walking around with it, like no, flushing his mouth. It was, it was once a day. <laughs> you know what though, with the beets and uh, increasing nitric oxide, there's a lot of supplements in the fitness space to boost nitric oxide for the pump, right? If you look at the studies on consuming beets versus like citrulline or arginine or these other compounds that people use to boost nitric oxide, beets kick the crap out of those other ones and well, the performance benefits. You know why? My hypothesis would be that when you consume beetroot powder, mm -hmm. you're you're consuming it too quickly because mm. you're drinking it. Oh. Right? And your oral bacteria play a, a crucial role in, again, the conversion of those nitrates, Interesting. which are present in beetroot powder, to nitrites. So what I would do um, and I don't use this supplement. I would, um, instead of just gulping it down, rinse um, it in your mouth. Or? I would swish with it to give your oh, to give your oral bacteria a chance to do oh. its job. And I would bet 
that you would see a difference. Bro, I'm uh, doing that in my workout tomorrow. <laughs> Try it. Let me know. That's my that's gargle hypo- the red a, juice. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's my great. on the spot hypothesis. Um, well, but, it makes sense based on what you said. Yeah, but yeah. I would bet that that's, that's why you see that difference. Bro, I always learn something from you. Uh, so <laughs> always. Yeah. All right. So uh, obviously they can buy your book anywhere books are sold. Yeah. If you go to geniuskitchenbook.com, we also have some bonuses. If you, if you um, pre-order it, I've got a, a free ebook that I wrote called 15 Daily Steps to Lose Weight and Prevent Disease. So if you, if you, Pre-order the book. You can fill out the form, get that ebook free. But um, if the book is already out, you can order it anywhere books are sold. Um, Amazon, your local bookstore. Love to support local bookstores. Uh, yeah, so check it out. Good Again, deal. Genius Kitchen. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks always, man. Thanks yeah. for coming on the show and thanks for writing great stuff. Love yeah. you guys. Yeah, Appreciate yeah. it. Yeah.